have a steady crowd here so far. So I'm going to start my introduction. And um, like I say, I may look away for a minute to admit some more people. Again, I'm Bob Jolly, director here at the Athenaeum. And welcome to the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum Arts and Culture presentation with author Bill Schubart. I'm going to introduce Bill in just a minute. I'm just going to give you a few um, odds and ends to start the program. The session is being recorded. Uh, did you get that prompt when, when you were admitted? Did you, OK, good. I wanted to make sure that that happens when everybody joins. Um, ask your questions via the chat. And I'll ask Bill as many as we can get to at the end. Um, that, that's how we're going to start this. I don't know if we're going to have um, back and forth dialogue or not. It depends. Bill will determine that. Um, tomorrow, you'll receive a feedback form from the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum, and it's going to come from inform at stjathenaeum.org. We would love to get your comments on this session. So if it looks like a weirdo um, um, email, it is from us. It's a feedback form. It's a Google Doc, so it's quick to fill out, and we'd love to get your feedback on this. Um, the rest of this series can be found on our website at stjathenaeum.org under the events tab. So there are other sessions coming up. There are four more. You can see them there. Um, the next one is March 9th with Doreen Lyon, and she'll be talking about cookbooks. Let's see, nobody to admit. That's good. Let me introduce Bill Schubart. Bill was born, sorry, there is someone to let in. I'm going to jump over here and do this. There's that. Bill was Bill was born. There's the start of the introduction. And then, then we go on from there. Uh, Bill was born in New York City and grew up in Morrisville from age two. He attended public school and then went on to Phillips Exeter Academy, Kenyon College, and the University of Vermont, where he earned a degree in French language and culture, which he taught until he entered communications as an entrepreneur. He co-founded Philo Records, I was amazed to find that out, and in 1982, the company Resolution, a fully integrated e-commerce services company for broadcasters, print and electronic publishers, and direct marketers. He writes and speaks extensively on the media, book publishing, and civic issues, and has long been a commentator on Vermont Public Radio and a columnist at VT Digger. He has spoken at many industry and media events, including Book Expo. His interests include poetry, photography, stone gardening, and classical, traditional, and primitive music. He lives in Hinesburg, Vermont, with his wife, Catherine, a journalist. And he has three sons, Bill, Peter, and Stephen, and a daughter, Anna, as well as a stepson, Guy, and a stepdaughter, Phoebe. Go to www.shubart.com and you can see all kinds of great things from Bill, including all of his published work, well, all of his books, many of his published articles, commentaries, etc. And you can even hear Bill and other people reading excerpts from his works. Bill, take it away. Thank you for being here. Well, Bob, thank you. It's a great pleasure. Um, I'm honored to be here with all of you tonight and um, looking forward to getting to know you and to hearing a little bit about your projects. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to talk um, with you a little bit, just, um, and bring forth some observations about, you know, um, my own time as a writer, um, and um, give you a sense of what I've learned. Um, and, but I'm not going to spend our entire time together as a talking head, because I want to learn from you. And um, so we'll have plenty of opportunity for discussion. I want to hear what some of you are up to, what you're working on, and uh, really have it be more of a discussion. But um, let me jump in and um, just say a, a few words. Bob did a pretty good job giving you my background. Um, as he and I were talking about earlier, it was, it was kind of a schizophrenic background um, because um, from the age of six, I would always spend a couple of weeks with my grandmother in New York City, and she was very connected to the publishing industry. Roger Strauss of Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux was a cousin, and I did know him. Uh, Alfred Knopf was my grandmother's first cousin, and I never met him, but I did meet Blanche several times at, at her apartment, and um, 
And then when I, um, when I went on to Exeter, I was lucky enough to get into a class taught by George Bennett, who taught some, who taught creative writing and taught, it was actually his last year teaching, but he taught some of America's really great writers, including uh, James Agee and uh, a number of others. And that really um, piqued my interest in writing. I wasn't a particularly good student. Um, this was back in the days when if you got a B minus on something, it was worth calling home. And I say that because we have a foreign exchange student who's, who's going to CVU, who's very bright. And uh, she, I, you know, I looked at her grade point average and it was 4.2. And I said, wait a second, that's like 110%. I thought it just went to four. And she said, no, they kind of do it differently. Um, she said, I, um, I have three A pluses and two A's. Those are my grades. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I didn't know anyone at Exeter who ever got an A. Um, and the teachers I had in Morrisville were, frankly, to be blunt, they didn't give a shit about my self-esteem. They just wanted to make damn sure I learned. And their best tool for teaching me was fear. Um, so I, I did my homework. Um, and when I got a B, I was ecstatic, but different topic. Um, I, um, I never really got a chance. I, I did write when I was in college and was lucky enough to have a short story published in the Great Lakes Review and a couple of others, but didn't really get it the time to turn my, my own attention to writing until, um, until I retired about uh, 15 years ago. And my mind was just filled with all these short stories that were actually real stories that I knew growing up in Morrisville. And I started putting them into a collection. Um, and my first book came out, The Lamoille Stories, which is still my bestseller. Um, and um, I've, written, uh, I've written a total of nine books, um, novels, short stories, there's a collection of short stories that I really, you know, and, and we'll talk more about this. I had to write. Um, you're looking at a man now who weighs 285 pounds. And when I was in my 40s, I weighed just shy of 500 pounds. And I realized that um, I was addicted to refined carbohydrates. I just couldn't stop eating you know, bread and cookies. And um, it was it was more starchy stuff than it was sugary stuff because sugar was like too strong. It was like my 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 addiction was bread and wheat and flour. Um, and sugar was just too strong. It, it just hit me too hard. And I went away to a very, very unfancy treatment facility. Um, and to make a long story short, over the course of a couple of years, lost 240 pounds, slowly, safely, um, and have pretty much, you know, uh, managed to keep that in. But I, I had to write about that. So I published a book called Fat People, which is a collection of short stories, most of which are based in reality. Um, there's no miracles. There's nothing in there. There's nothing about diets or weight loss. It was really, I wanted to write a collection of short stories that created a sense of understanding and empathy for people whose greatest friend is food and is their worst enemy is food. Um, and that, that, that's actually done very well, continues to do well, became part of, in a couple of medical schools, the, um, their, their library of, um, they actually medical schools are have been trying to teach humanities to create you know to enhance bedside manner we'll leave it at that um and um my latest book is odd and dark illustrated by jeff danziger uh it's a mirror image i know um but it's called the correctional facility and that is a, or that is based in um my Catholicism, I was baptized Catholic at uh, age four or three, somewhere around there. 
I was an altar boy at age seven, knew the mass in French, Latin, and English by the time I was eight. And then when I went away to Exeter and read The Legend of the Grand Inquisitor by Dostoevsky and the Brothers Karamazov, I walked away from Catholicism and never came back. Um, and to this day, have a love-hate relationship with Catholicism. Some of my closest friends were priests um, right up until recently. Anyway, um, I was just fascinated by the idea of how the concept of sin has changed in 700 years. Things that were sins in Dante's time are not sins today, like suicide or masturbation or, you know, these things were lethal, mortal sins. And our concept has changed. Anyway, um, I, I want to talk about you and writing. Um, and um, I, I think perhaps the most important thing I would say to you tonight is that it's really important to understand that you are writing for someone. And it's important to know who that person is um, and to have that discussion with yourself. You can write for yourself, that's journaling. Um, people have done it throughout history um some journals have immense interest way beyond um the self um some uh, have no interest beyond the self but um it's an important part part of writing as well some people write for family memoirs some people write for community um some people write family memoirs that become a really critical part of history um, there are a lot of people in Vermont now who are writing family memoirs, and I have to tell you that having worked with some of those people, just trying to be helpful, um, and reading some of these, these have importance way beyond the family. They have really, really significance. They have real significance in Vermont history. Um, an author named David Holmes from Charlotte just published a really, really wonderful book about his family's, the 100 plus acre farm they owned in Charlotte on the water for 130 years and lost during the depression. And that, that's as much a book about Vermont as it is the Holmes family. And there are, there are a number of, so memoirs can be very important. Um, then there's the whole business of genres um science fiction romance eroticism um you know um mystery um and those you know have they they have there are examples there of absolutely fabulous really important world literature and trash and it's all okay but the point of all this is to understand who you're writing for um I, I, I have a test when somebody says, will you read my manuscript? Um, it's, people don't understand that that's really a lot to ask of somebody. If somebody says, you know, I've just written a, uh, a novel of 320 pages and I'd like you to read it or whatever it is, you're asking for, you know, half a week of somebody's time. So my answer always is, look, I'm happy to read the first 50 pages of your manuscript um, if I'm engaged. Um, and if you've taken your craft seriously, I may well read the whole thing. But if not, are you going to be comfortable with my saying to you, I'm sorry, but the book did not get my attention? And if the answer is, oh, no, no, you don't understand. You're going to love my book then I just simply say, I'm sorry, I'm the wrong person. And, and that, that sort of sums up the conflict between the artistic ego and the understanding that writing really is in many ways a collaborative process. And I'll talk more about that as we go on. But the first part of that collaboration is, who are you writing for? Just understanding who you're writing for. Um, the collaborative process goes much deeper than that. I, and I'll, I'll just tell you what my own, my own process is. When I, when I finish a manuscript, 
which may be anywhere from three to six rewrites. Um, and I feel comfortable um, with what I've written, but not that it's finished. Um, I give that to three critical readers. These are people that I may know or may not know. They're not family members. They're not people who want to make me feel good. They're avid readers who I know are going to be really tough. And because I'm asking a lot of them, I say, look, I'm happy to pay you a $200 fee to read this and, you know, spend an hour with me and tell me what you, what you get out of this, what I need to change. Um, um, most of them just say, oh, well, let me give it a read and then I'll, you know, take me to lunch or something. And that's fine. But I want to acknowledge to them that I've asked a lot of them. So when I get the feedback from these three critical readers, um, I take that and I rewrite the manuscript again. And the typical feedback that I might get is, um, you know, the, I was good with the arc of the narrative. I, I loved the ending. Um, I thought you had too much digression, you know, in the third and fourth chapter. It was almost like you wanted people to know how much you know. And it was a distraction. So tone that down. And, um, and your two principal characters came off really, really well. But I have to say, um, you, you didn't do a very good job developing this character. And I felt that character was really critical. And I didn't know that character. Um, and I wanted to know that character. You need to do more there. That's the kind of feedback I would get at that stage. So I would integrate all of that. Um, and then it would go to a literary editor. And I have for years used a woman in New York. Um, and um, she does mostly academic um, manuscripts. She does not do fiction, which actually is wonderful for me because she looks at my work, which is all literary fiction um, with new eyes. So um, she, she gives me about a page worth of feedback and she reads very carefully. And, and that is anywhere from five to 600 bucks, depending on her, um, you know, depending on how much time she has to spend on it. So um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get that. So there's not a glare there. Um, and then I take and um, feed that back um, and rework the manuscript again. If the book is in trouble, um, and I've only had to do this once, I tend to go then to what's called a development editor or a developmental editor. And that's somebody who looks at it and says, okay, you know, structurally, here's what's going on here and here's what we need to do. So, uh, but I've only done that in one book. Um, then when all that's done, um, I, I take what is almost finished and I take it to a copy editor or a line editor. That's the person who is not necessarily going to review it as a work of art, but they're going to make sure that the craft is all there. The grammar, the punctuation, um, and... I've used several different people who are terrific and tough. And my manuscript comes back, you know, with commas changed to semicolons and, you know, things that weren't there all filled in. And I, I've talked to authors who say, oh, what do you bother with that? You know, why is, why is that important? And it's important in the same way in writing as it is for painting. If you don't understand the craft, if you don't understand color, if you don't understand how to use the craft to convey what you want to convey, you're creating a whole bunch of distractions for the reader. If somebody's reading along and they're immersed in your story, which you want them to be, um, and all of a sudden they become across, they come across a word that's misspelled, that's a distraction. It lifts them out of your storyline. And you don't want that. My rule of thumb um, is that I want any book 
that I publish um, to look like it was published by Random House or Simon & Schuster or Farrar, Strauss & Drew. I'm a little reluctant to say that nowadays because I'm you know, spending $30 on some new hard copies that look like they haven't even been copy edited and uh, you know, that they actually have mistakes in them, which didn't used to be the case. But in any case, that's, um, um, I just, if I'm going to put all that creative energy into creating a narrative or a selection of short stories or even a poem, I want the craft to be there. I want it to reflect how much I care and how much energy I put into this. Um, so that's sort of on, on the writing end of things. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about publishing. Um, and then I'd like to just take a break and ask some of you to tell me, you know, concisely who you are, what you're doing, what you're working on, and then we'll just kind of open it up to, to questions, columns, challenges. Um, so um, the, when I was young, um, there were two publishers. There were the, the great publishers, some of the names of which I've mentioned, the, you know, the random houses and the, the traditional publishers. Um, and then there were the vanity publishers. And the big famous one that I remember as a kid, and some of you may remember, was Vantage Press. And they wouldn't take anything. They wouldn't take absolute garbage, but they'd take pretty much anything you were willing to pay to have put into a book. Um, <clears throat> And if you wanted to spend some money, they might even advertise it a little bit. Um, but that was vanity publishing. So there was just vanity and traditional. There was nothing in between. It was like nurses and doctors. There was no spectrum. And today, just like nurses and doctors, that whole spectrum is filled out. You know, there, there are um, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants. And in publishing, that area has filled out <clears throat> Um, with hybrid publishers, um, and there are different names, you know, for them. Um, and there's a, there's a huge range that runs from vanity to traditional publishing. But um, I tend to, to call those people hybrid. Some people call them assist publishers. But in essence, there are people who, for the most part, think that your work is worthwhile um, they can't afford to take the risk that a traditional publisher would take and say, okay, we'll publish this book. Um, we'll take the risk of doing the edit, design, printing, distribution, um, and in extremely rare cases, I need you to hear this, you know, uh, arrange a book tour or a book signing tour or buy some display advertising. Um, those days are pretty much gone, even in traditional publishing, with the exception of the top four or five percent of best-selling authors. <clears throat> um, in fact, um, if you know, if a major publisher, if you get through all the, the the sort of defensive mechanisms and you get an agent, and you know, a publisher says, "I'm interested in your work," the first question they're going to ask you is. How are you going to sell this book? What's your platform? And the implication of that, of course, is we're not going to. And the irony is that's pretty true. I mean, if you have a record, if you are not a backlist author, if you are a best selling author, they'll pour the money in and they'll make all their money back and more. But um, if you're new, um, um, that's the question. That's the challenge. What's your platform? How are you going to sell the book? Um, I've done um, I've done everything. Um, I most of my books are self published. Um, one book um, was published by Simon and Schuster. Um, this again, I guess you're probably looking at a mirror image too. But Lila and Theron. It's a novel, um, and they liked it a lot. They put it out there. They didn't do anything. They told me they weren't going to do anything. They asked me how I was going to sell the book. And I said I would do the best I could. And um, I, th I think the sales 
they remaindered it just a couple of months ago. And I think the sales were somewhere around three to 6,000. I haven't gotten a definite number from them, um, which for me is good. That's not a bad number at all. For them, it's nothing. And I know they're, they're um, head of sales and marketing quite well. And, um, you know, I said, so, you know, are you even looking at literary fiction? And they said, literary fiction, literary fiction. What is that again? He said, you, you got any Trump books? You know, you, you're thinking maybe about writing about Trump? I mean, Simon & Schuster has, I don't know, they've, they've done probably five Trump books and, you know, that's so. Um, uh, but it was a good experience. I learned a tremendous amount from it. Um, and I published, my first book, Lamoille Stories, was published with a hybrid publisher, uh, Sonia Hakala, who some of you may know. Um, she had White River Press. Um, she did a terrific job. She did everything she said she was going to do. I worked like the devil to sell the book and did well. And at the point where um, the, the sales were down to, I don't know, a couple of hundred a year or something, she said, look, do you want it back? And I said, yes, thank you. And I republished it on my own press, which is Magic Hill Press. So at this point in time, with um, the Simon & Schuster book coming back to me, um, all nine of my books will be self-published um, with my own press. And I can answer questions about that. To go back to the developmental cost and the hiring of editors and copy editors and so on and so forth, it may be helpful to understand that when I do my own, one of my own books, my typical investment for everything except my time is $28 to $3,400. That includes all the fees I pay uh, right up through design. And I hold my designer, um, who for my most recent books has been uh, Mason Singer in Montpelier, who is a veteran. He's done literally hundreds of beautiful books. Um, and um, my deal is you're gonna design the book um, and you're gonna create the finished files for the text block. You're gonna design all the text, all the interior and the cover wrap, which is the front, back and spine and those are two separate files and you're gonna upload those to Lightning Source, which is my printer and distributor. And um, those files have to be approved technically. And then you have to approve a press copy. And then at that point you're done. Um, and that works very well. And I can answer questions about that. Um, and then at that point, you know, a few days later, the book is available worldwide. Um, any bookstore in the world can look in the Ingram database, look up Bill Schubart, um, and my books will be there, and a bookstore can order it. Um, so that's, you know, qu really quite a bit about um, publishing. It is changing at warp speed. I would venture to say that the major publishers that I know are confused about what's happening. They themselves don't quite know what's happening. They're all looking for the next, you know, um, you know, bestseller. Um, um, they're all struggling with um, political correctness, with diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, they're asking themselves all kinds of questions, and they are, of course. Um, flummoxed by Amazon. And I want to say, uh, I want to say one thing about Amazon that is a caveat. Um, if you are working on a book, and if you decide that you want to use Amazon's create space publishing model, um, they do a pretty good job. Um, they'll produce a pretty good book for you but there's not an independent bookstore, and th this is an overstatement, there's not an independent bookstore in Vermont that'll carry it because of the antipathy um, between um, Amazon and the independent bookstores, the incredible damage that Amazon has done. 
Um, some of you may know Mike DeSanta, who, who owns Phoenix Books and owns, he and Renee own, I think, either six or seven independent bookstores in Vermont now. And if you bring him a book that you did with Amazon, that book will not be available in any of his stores. And <clears throat> I'll tell you a, a, another story that explains that a bit. I was having lunch a couple of years ago with um, Chris Morrow, who then owned Northshire Bookstore um, in Manchester, which is now a nationally known bookstore. Um, the family has since sold it, but um, it's still a phenomenal bookstore. And he said, we were having lunch and he said, Bill, what would you say if I said to you that, um, you know, uh, 10, 15 times a day, one of my clerks goes over to someone who's come into my store and asks them to leave. I said, whoa, explain that. And he said, here's what happens. He said, my bookstore, my, my clerks watch, somebody comes in, they shop around my store, they pull books off the shelf, they open them up, they read a few pages, and if they like the book, they turn it with a barcode out, they scan it with their cell phone, the order's placed automatically at Amazon, um, they get the hard copy book two days later for three or four dollars less than I would charge them for the book, so they use me as a demonstration place for Amazon. And he said, I'm very polite. He said, I go up to them and they say, hey, look, I see what you're doing. You're buying this book at Amazon. And I need you to know that I have to buy these books, even though they're on consignment. I have to pay for them in 60 days. I have to pay to, to carry this, these, this inventory. And I can't afford to be Amazon's showroom. So if you really want to buy from Amazon, buy from their website, not from my store, and ask them to leave. Now, just think about the complexity of that. But anyway, that, that'll help explain why a lot of the independent bookstores are um, uncomfortable. There are, there are a lot of easy ways to produce a beautiful book. You don't have to use the Amazon model. Um, one last thing about hybrid publishers, and then I'd like to send, open it up a little bit and have you tell me who you are and what you're up to. Um, the, the measure in my view for a hybrid pub publisher is the value they bring and at what cost. Um, I know hybrid publishers who do a pretty good job, but they charge an outrageous amount of money for what they do. Um, and after all, it's a business, so you can't, you can't complain. But as somebody who's produced nine books and knows what it cost to produce a state-of-the-art book from a craft standpoint, <clears throat> um, I, I know what a hybrid publisher ought to be charging and, you know, and give them absolute room to make a reasonable profit on that. But I have seen um, really nicely done books that the hybrid publisher charged $50,000 to produce. And based on what I know about, um, you know, what it costs to produce a book, um, I would have probably charged eight or 9,000. Um, so if, if you are thinking of working with a hybrid and I am, very much in favor of good hybrid publishers. And there are a couple in Vermont. Um, um, I think Rootstock in Montpelier, uh, Stephen MacArthur does a good job. And um, the nice thing about Stephen's operation is he has an a la carte menu. He'll tell you what it'll cost to produce the book. He won't produce stuff that's garbage. So you won't be in bad company. Your book has to have some merit and some market value. Um, and, you know, if you want him to do some promotion or to arrange some in-store book signings or some, <clears throat> excuse me, some advertising, he has an a la carte menu and you can invest in that. Um, Mike DeSantos, um, again, Phoenix Books, they're Onion River Books. Um, I think they're terrific. They do not take anything that they don't think has merit. Um, and the nice thing about um, Onion River is 
um, if you work with them, you're working with somebody who already owns six or seven bookstores. So your books actually will, will be in a store. The cognitive, um, I don't wanna say cognitive dissonance, but the intense misunderstanding between new writers and bookstore owners is something that a bunch of us are really working to try and resolve. Um, as some of you may know, the, the Burlington Book Fair um, is coming back in a much, uh, a much better organized, much more sophisticated way. And um, I'm suggesting that there be a panel of bookstore owners and new writers to actually engage in a discussion because typically what happens is somebody publishes a book um, either by themselves or with a hybrid publisher um, and they'll go into the Vermont bookshop and you know ask to speak to the manager and they'll say look here's my new book I've just published it and uh, it's terrific I know you're going to do really well with it and I'm happy to come you know do a book signing in your store and you want to take 25 copies and oh by the way could you pay me cash um and you know maybe give them a little window space over here you know i mean ah it's going to be great and the bookstore owner who is working their tail off to survive and they're doing much better now through diversification and for a lot of other reasons their response is going to be well i'll tell you what I'll take you one book on, assign, on consignment. And if it sells, I'll order another book and pay you for the first book. And if it doesn't sell, I'm gonna give it back to you. That's how we work. And it's such, it's such a shock. <laughs> you know? There's such a chasm of misunderstanding between new writers and bookstore owners. That that's something that really need, I mean, if you're gonna go in and ask a bookstore owner to carry your book, the place to start is understanding their business, how challenging it is, and propose a deal to them that, that is reasonable. You know, like, would you be willing to take five, five of my books on consignment? Okay, um, I've said a lot. Let me, let me stop there for a bit. And let me just ask you to, um, you know, to, um, I'll just call on you and say a few words um, about yourself. And um, can we go back to panel view, Bob, so I can see everybody at once? Right. Um, I seem to be dominating the screen. I thought I had done, I thought I had undone that, but let's see here. Um, uh, da, da, da. I thought I was an old hand at this. Well, you're better all you're better than I am. Well, I can start across the top. I'm going to um, go if you um, Bill, if you switch to gallery, tell me what you see gallery okay. view, you know, upper right hand corner. Yeah. And if everybody does that, that. Did it. that's perfect. OK, it was on good. Me. I'm good. good. Thanks. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Don, you want to say a few words about yourself? Where do you live and what are you working on and what are your questions? Thank you. Um, I, I'm, sure I'm very grateful that that you let me in here. I, I live in New Hampshire, uh -huh. um, and um, uh, for the last That's not a thing. Um, well, you know, talk to my wife. She was raised in Springfield, Vermont, and uh -huh. uh, and so, yeah. um, and um, I'm a. Um, I know that you write a little bit about health policy, Bill, um, and I, I'm a. I'm a country doctor, um, now retired. Um, and I, the first part of my career, I was in northern New Hampshire, taking right on the border. And I, for this, just because um, the Northeast Kingdom is a good brand, um, I, I say that I write about characters from the Northeast Kingdom. Um, mm -hmm. But I, probably, truth be told, some of them, some of the of the those characters who wormed their way into my brain um, are, are from, were from New, New Hampshire. Um, but anyway, I, I write um, short fiction um, about people 
school um, farmers, loggers, um, small business owners. Um, I will often start from somebody who I knew, mm -hmm. um, but I, I, the, there's not there's not a doctor in most of the stories, although occasionally a, a doctor slips in. Yeah. Um, and they're usually 1500 to 2500 words mm -hmm. they're relatively short um i've had a few of them published in um in some online um magazines yeah uh, the, you the, haven't published as a collection no i i haven't and you know that's that's therein is some of my uh, of my questions for you i've only recently learned about hybrid publishing yeah. um and um and I, I honestly don't know whether my um stories count as literary fiction or not i um i, I think they sort of are there's the the there's not action or thriller um nobody well occasionally people die but they're not murdered um and um and my approach has been to try to get stories published in various um, literary journals, but I've got a goodly collection of rejection slips. Mm -hmm. um, I think the I had one story published in a in an anthology called um, the rural no the country doctor revisited. Mm -hmm. um, and so w one of my questions is yeah. for a short story writer, um, um, how important is it to get the stories individually published before trying to trying to get it published um you know let's say with a hybrid publisher i will say that the the best compliment um i ever got was i read a, a story um i was out in the midwest someplace and i read a story at a, at a meeting and some guy came up to me and he said that story sounds like howard frank mosher um <laughs> And, and and I so I, that, that that's the greatest compliment that I've ever gotten. Yeah, um, yeah. I, that's yeah. so. Here's here's what I would say, Don. I um, obviously getting getting stories published in reviews uh, or you know um, collections, you know, is is a good thing and it does help. But it's important to understand now, and I hate to say this. But the whole business of publishing um, has become a thriving uh, business that has a dark side. I mean, I get constant emails from literary reviews that essentially, if I pay them enough money, they'll publish my short story. And, you know, then I get a, a free copy of it, you know. So you have to be really careful to sniff out whether this is really a literary publisher or whether it's a vanity publisher, because it's getting harder and harder to tell. The business of preying on the literary ego is blossoming at this point. I've never seen anything like it. Hmm. So just be cautious about that. And remember that that kind of publication, as much as you'd like to imagine it is permanent, is really temporal. And if you have enough to warrant, you know, even a 140 page paperback, um, that's that collection is going to be what people are going to remember you by. And I don't know if you're there yet. I, I, um, but I think about, I've got about a, a dozen store. Well, you know, a dozen stories that are 97% done. Okay, well, then what you might do, and I would just challenge you to do this, and then I'm, I'm going to move on to someone else. Um, not that you won't have another chance to ask questions, um, is you might now start focusing on, I'd like to get to a, a book of short stories. What do you need to do to finish your stories, to get some critical feedback, as we discussed, that you feel comfortable um and because that's going to be a more durable legacy than being published in some of these um anthologies i'm not saying it's not a good thing because it is 
Um, but, you know, having a book with a collection of short stories, I think, given where you are, would be a really good goal to pursue. So I'll come back to you um, and you'll have a chance to answer, ask other questions. Uh, Chris, do you want to say a few words? Chris Hodsell. No, no, I am never going to write another book ever. <laughs> I've written one book and I've Which done it, fabulous. been there, done that and never again. Now the guy whose head you can see down here, he's writing more books. Yeah. Oh, I know. He doesn't he's, want to talk about them. He's, you know, he no, always. I'm not, not going to talk. About he, he says he won't talk about them, so uh, you just have to I wait. It, but the person hiding off camera is Bill Mayers, who <laughs> right. is a, a terrific writer. Um, and if you haven't seen him, you ought to take a look. And Chris's book, we have a copy of it here, and it's a prized possession. Um, it's on the theater curtains. Um, which has been a life's work and it's a, a, a book of great beauty. Okay, um, I see Mark Banks. You're muted. You need to- There we go. Right. Yep. Tell us a little um, bit about what you're up to. Okay, well, I'm a recently retired psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for the last, gosh, 10, 12, 14 years, perhaps I've been working on this puppy. Um, shortly after I read Eric Larson's book, uh, Devil in the White City, where he mentions on one page, uh, and maybe a couple of pages beyond that, that uh, the uh, antagonist in his book, H.H. Uh, Holmes, Serial Killer, probably America's, fir America's first identified serial killer, um, was actually in Burlington on two separate instances, one as a student, first year student in medical school, and uh, about a dozen years later, uh, he came through and he was on the run um, and spent uh, some time here before getting arrested in Boston. So after, you know, some uh, lots of research in the Boston uh, library and all over, I've compiled this work of uh, historical fiction where I fill in the gaps because, you know, Larson had a, a line or two about it and I've got about 175 pages worth of it. Um, with a, a fictitious person who he interacts with and ends up with in a, a life and death situation. Um, right. And then... That, that sounds like a, a really terrific work. Um, it is, um, it's the kind of thing that uh, traditional publishers are looking for. Having said that, um, you have never seen such a phenomenal system of gatekeeping in your life as you will see at the point where, you, you know, you want to come to the attention of a traditional publisher. Um, I never went through an agent. I went directly to Simon & Schuster but, because I knew people there. Um, but um, what you're writing, um, I think, is very, um, very much in the popular genre and, you know, um, as you pursue that, you may want to begin the research necessary, um, do some work around writing what they call an agent letter. You know, um, I'm sure you've followed that. But um, I, I think that's really exciting because that is the kind of thing um, that done right with the right publisher and the right support can, can really skyrocket. Um, do you have any specific questions? And again, this isn't your last opportunity to ask. Yeah, well, I, you know, just uh, I'm just a new a new babe in the waters of agents and all. I have a, a good friend who uh, recently got accepted by Simon and Schuster, um, and uh, she's going to be one of my beta readers. And right now, my work is off being um, edited by a very very capable ex teacher. Great. Um, I don't know that I have more more questions beyond that because it's all so new to me. I'm just going going to these kind of webinars and just trying to get myself educated about what the landscape is like. Well, <clears throat> it's really really interesting. Um, I would encourage you to keep going on it, and, um, and you know, wish you the best of luck. Thanks, Daniel Cox. <clears throat> hi, um, <clears throat> hi there. 
And I was laughing because I just had Chris and uh, Bill over for dinner last night or last weekend. And your name always comes up when we have uh, when we get together with those guys. So anyways, uh, I'm a coffee guy. I still have a, a job, which I like. But um, I've written two technical books on um, uh, coffee for the legal community. Both are published. I definitely used uh, Phoenix Books, and they, uh, they were fantastic. Can't say enough about them. But um, when my daughter was small, um, I made up a story that lasted three years. And I would read to her almost every night. And I wouldn't read, I'd just recite. I read all of the Harry Potter books to her and that was just a phenomenal experience. Unbelievable. I couldn't wait to get home. And when I went on a trip, I came back and I'd find out she was a book ahead of me and I was incredible. Because <clears throat> she wouldn't, you know, she wouldn't wait for me. So mm -hmm. anyways, I've got the story in me um, and it's a kid's book. So some of my questions are, um, who should proofread this? So. Uh, my first thought was, well, well, parents, so what's my age limit? And I'm thinking uh, about four to eight. That's my target audience, four to eight. Um, uh, and then I said, well, four to eight year olds aren't going to be the proofreaders. So, uh, or, or do you get, and my next thought would be, well, uh, teachers of elementary school teachers or possibly young parents. But I'm, that's, that's a, uh, a little bit of a conundrum for me. And my second one is how, how long, so when a kid, when I, when I investigate most of the kid's book and I, I don't consider Harry Potter a kid's book anymore, that's a young teen's book. Uh, and cause those are pretty long. The length of the book and is, should it be, uh, the, should the story all go in one book it sh or it should be a series of books. So, uh, and, and I certainly, yeah. <laughs> Amazon, and yes, they are the evil empire. There is no doubt in my mind. I'm also delighted to see that it appears that more people are reading hardcover books now or paperback books versus ebooks. And I, I, I definitely feel I'm not an ebook reader, but there are a hell of a lot of people are. And it depends, I just, it depends yes, a lot. It depends a lot, Daniel, on the on the genre. Um, I get embarrassed because I'd I'd go into you know, bookstores to do a reading and people would say, oh my God, what do you think about eBooks? And I would gasp and say, well, the last 40 novels I read were eBooks. And, <laughs> and our house is so full of books, like most of your houses are, we can hardly walk. And, um, but again, I can wake up in the middle of the night and read for an hour and not wake up Kate you know, um, so I, I, I think all the genres are important. And I would say this to all of you, if you're going to take your work seriously um, and you care about it, you are going to publish your work as an ebook, as an audio book, and as a print book. That's just de rigueur at this point. Now it varies with genre, you know, how much, you know, but again, I, I think it is, it's important to, to think that way. Let me go back to your, your first question um, about readers. <clears throat> the one thing I didn't hear, which I think would be really good, would be a couple of children's librarians. Um, these are people, and there are, there, number, there are a number of them in the state. Bob, you probably know some. And um, there are some who are legendary, like, um, God, what's her name? Green. Chris, help me. Um, Grace Green, the famous. Grace Green, Grace Green. You know, there are people like that whose knowledge of children's literature is immense and they can help you. Um, you know, they can answer a lot of questions. They can find you critical readers or be a critical reader. Um, <clears throat> so I would, I, would, I would look there first. Um, parents is too broad a category. Um, not out of the question, but it's, it's pretty broad. Um, as to the formatting, I mean, uh, people approach children's books in two different ways. They either want to create a dependency on a series that's going to make them a multimillionaire, or they're focused on the work itself. And I think that you should focus on the work itself, and the work will help inform you as to what the format is. 
whether it's a cereal, you know, uh, you know, whether it's cereal work or whether it's a single work, whether you have characters who migrate from book one to book two, you know, does the arc of the narrative end in each book or is it taken up again? You need to figure that out because that's an intrinsic part of the narrative that you're going to create. Mm -hmm. So you need to give that some real serious attention. There's no right or wrong. Um, from a publishing standpoint, either can work. Um, and um, then the other part, then the other part, yeah. Bill, is I'm the illustrators. And now um, there seems to be a very definite art to the covers of books. And yep. that's incredibly important, especially yep. I think it's books. And then are these, is this, are these illustrated books or yeah, are these? No, it's right now it's a one book and it's definitely going to be illustrated, but the illustrations are not going to carry the story or they're okay. going to, they're going to just augment the story. Okay. And like you, I know a bunch of illustrators from Ed Corn, you know, sure. to the, the local guys that are great sure. that obviously would charge a good buck as well. They should. But the cover of the book is is paramount, and I have no idea what that would look like. With the okay, well, let me say a couple of things about that. One is, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned Ed, who's a good friend, and the thing you need to understand is there's a difference between an artist and an illustrator. An illustrator is going to be driven by your story. An artist is going to be driven by their own aesthetic, yeah. and that's a really critical distinction. Um, you know. Um, Ed has a very specific style, which I love. Um, but is it the right style for what you're writing? You know, so give that some thought. That's that's one caveat. Um, <clears throat> I, I um, as Bob said, my brother and I started Fado Records um, in the early 70s. And one of the things that we used to hear all the time is you know, oh, I've got this girlfriend and, you know, she wants to be a graphic designer and, oh, she's, you know, I want her to do my cover. The answer uniformly has been no. We never, ever let an artist do their own cover. And I think the same is true of a book. They are different art forms. And the question is, what is the purpose of a book cover? Most people will say to you, it's to reflect the content of the book. Other people will say it's to sell the book. You want, imagine that sitting face out on a bookshelf in a bookstore, you want someone to pick it up and take a look. Now it can do both, but um, writing a book and designing a cover are two different art forms. And my philosophy is you find the best book designer you can find and you say please read the book and bring me some tissues I trust you and that's the way I've always worked and I've always been blessed with beautiful covers don't be um, prescriptive about the design of your book as long as it reflects you know obviously reflects what, what you're doing find a great designer and give them latitude and you'll be pleasantly surprised. No, I'm, I'm a big fan of, I, I use a lot of art artists in my work. Yep. And my goal when I, when I get, hire an artist to say, this is what I don't want. Yeah. If, I, if I have to tell you what I want, I don't need you. So yep. you have free reign to do whatever the hell you want. I'm hiring you because you know your craft. I don't know your craft. That is exactly the attitude I'm suggesting. And you've got it right on. Okay, I'm going to move ahead here to Anne Marie. And Bill, I just want to interject before we go sure. on. We're at an hour. I am happy to stay here and to you folks out there who haven't spoken, if you want to, as long as you want, just to assure you, um, we're not going to stop at 8.05. We'll stop if Bill is fatigued or you all go away, but otherwise. I'm sorry, I may have Bill. misunderstood. I thought we were running from 7 to 8.30, but I'm oh, totally. Yeah, good. I'm I just willing, wanted yeah, I'm willing we'll go to go with the flow. As, Oh, I, I just want to go as long as we want and assure people if they thought it was going to end soon, it won't. We will be here as okay. long as well, we we'll, are having a we'll, good time. We'll keep moving along. This has yeah. been, I mean, I, I love the discussion that we're having.
Yes, me so, too. I don't want to shorten did, anybody. Did I see, Anne-Marie, that your microphone's not working? Uh, and, and I can see yes. in the chat, yes, yeah, she says her yeah. mic isn't working, just enjoying the okay. chat. She has no questions. Okay, that's fine. Um, so um, I'm going to move ahead to Darla Bruno. Oh, Do you have I, any questions? Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're doing, Darla. Uh, well, you know, writing is just a hobby for me. Um, I used to write a lot of um, short stories, fiction, and uh, I was wanting to put together a collection book. I was trying to write up enough, you know, stories to, to have a book, and I never got finished. I probably got two thirds of the way done. Um, they were like Twilight Zone type stories with the twist kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd given them out to a couple of people to read and I uh, got some really good feedback. They really liked it. Um, but I just, one story, I got stuck on a plot point and then I never picked it up again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but more recently, what I was planning on doing was a book on um, like a photography poetry book, yep. sort of a combo book. Yep. But I don't know how well either of those types of books sell these days, um, or if there's any market for those. But they're very, very difficult books. Yeah. They're really difficult books, and part of the reason is um, most of the ones that I've seen, and I'm going to be blunt, are terrible. Mm -hmm. um, they're not a true aesthetic collaboration. Um, <clears throat> in the way that the great photography books are. Um, <clears throat> it's the degree of aesthetic intimacy um, between the photographer and the poet has to be so deep and so thorough um, that it, it's, um, you know, I, I know people who just go out and take a lot of pretty pictures and then they write a pretty poem and they put it at the bottom and it's terrible. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm, I'm being blunt. If you decide to do that, you know, base it on a, a relationship and a spiritual connection with a photographer um, that is really substantive. Um, and even then know that they don't particularly sell well. Um, and I, I, I am an immense fan of photography. I mean, I, our house is filled um, with photographs. My great uncle was Alfred Stieglitz. So, you know, people in our family were just taking photographs all the time. Um, and so it's a really, really compelling area. But when you ma marry it to poetry, it's got to be a marriage made in heaven. Yeah. Is that helpful at all? No, no, it's good. It's good to know. I'm, yeah, I, I figured as much. But I, I, I don't mean to be discouraging. I'm just, I'm trying to be realistic. And I, I think it's very possible to do. But um, again, that, that collaboration has to have a deep aesthetic intimacy to work. Yeah. Can I answer anything else for you? Um, no, I think that's all. Okay. Um, Don, Don Smith. You're muted, Don. Are you there, Don? Okay. Um, unmute yourself and I'm gonna jump ahead to Diane Donovan. And I'll come back to you, Don. Diane, you're muted. Do you want to have any questions or you want to give us a little bit of a sense of who you are and what you're up to? Uh, sure. Well, uh, I uh, have been writing short stories for about the last 20 years and I've never published one of them. Um, I have been a member of the BWW, Burlington Writers Workshop. I don't know if people are familiar with uh, yeah. the organization uh, and uh, gotten some really good feedback on uh, my stories. Um, 
I uh, have refined a lot of them over the years. I'm getting fed up with looking at them, and I really can't. I can't go over them much anymore. I just uh, want to throw them in a big bag and get 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 rid of them at this point. I really do. <laughs> I, I I like my characters. They're kind of quirky and uh, strange, uh, funny characters. Uh, for example, I have uh, um, uh, a blind, unsighted uh, man who uh, wants to be in a braille poker game, and uh, you know, uh, but you know, that's just part of the story. Uh, mm -hmm. He uh, hitchhikes around and. You know, uh, he likes to meet different people as he hitchhikes uh, around the country and creates poems. And now my car I like my characters to uh, be involved in each one has an artistic medium, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's theater or poetry. Um, I have a, a farmer who uh, uh, loves poetry as well. If you if anybody ever took Latin, then one of the first sentences in the Latin book is Agricole sunt poete. And I always thought about that in Catholic school. Really, are they really poets? Um, are farmers really poets? And of course, they can be poets. Why not? So one of my farmers is a poet. And uh, so, you know, I, I just want to kind of get get these things off out of my hair forever. I don't want to look at them because they're getting really dated now. <laughs> well, let me, ask you this. let me ask you this, Diane. I mean, it's clearly your writing um, and it's a very it's a very good purpose. I mean, you're writing because these people inhabit you and you need to get them out and on paper and you need to share them with other people. Do you have any aspirations? Um, do you think at some point you'd like to refine some of these stories into a short story collection or um, and it's fine as it is? Or are you comfortable with you where you are right now? Uh, well, you know, I suppose I'd like to put them together in a, a collection and maybe just find a, a, a self-publisher who will, you know, uh, uh, put them together and, and put it online or whatever. Uh, I, 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 I've never heard of the hybrid publishers, so that was very informative for me to learn of, uh, you know, White River Press and Onion River Books and mm -hmm. these Vermont uh, publishers that I'm unaware of, and uh, you know maybe I'll uh, I'll look them up and uh, you know uh, uh, I think it's well, a question uh, of uh, thousands of dollars to me. I don't really want to. Um, it you doesn't know, I it don't... Can be thousands of dollars. It can be you know no. it, it you know it depends. But the the real question is, do you have a, a team of readers? I know Burlington Writers Workshop quite well. And you know they they're very good at providing feedback, but do you feel you have um, the resources to get feedback to help you to refine these to the point where you would consider publishing them in a in a chapbook um, or a short story collection? Well, I'm I would like to find some what do you call them data readers? That would be great if I yeah, could. Yeah. I've I've kind of a beaten up a few of my friends to read some of them and they just go, oh God, after about, you know, a couple of pages, they're not that interested. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, I, where would I find beta readers? Well, Burlington where Writers would I find Workshop people? is one of the most extensive networks of writers and, you know, in right. County in there. So I would look around in there and just see, you know, see what you find and, um, you know, try and get a couple of people to work with you. Any writer needs a support team and try and build yeah. that. If, if you want to get, there's no, there's no compulsion. It, it's perfectly okay to write short stories for yourself. It's perfectly okay. But if you're thinking about publishing, that would be your next step. All right. I'm going to jump ahead now to Thank Don you. Smith. Don, um, Thank you. I, see, I, I see you're muted. Okay. Um, well, let me do this then. Um, we're at 10 after eight. Let me ask, um, do any of you have any other questions or challenges or observations or, you know, is there any way that I can be can be helpful? I've, I'm 
really been enjoying this this discussion immensely. Don, you're muted. Yep. Could you say a little bit more about answering the question, who are you writing for? Um, I was surprised that you didn't challenge me with that. Um, and you um, made what turned out to be a valid assumption that I'd like people to write my, to read my stories um, and, and, um, and appreciate these wonderful, strong, smart, farmers and loggers and, and business people. Um, but I, I'm, I'm struggling with how to answer that question for myself. Um, and, um, and so, um, you know, you led with that as being you know, the, uh, the first thing to, to ask. And, and I'm, as, since I'm struggling, don't really have an answer. I mean, I, I was writing for people in my writing group. I remember we're writing group in White River Junction. Um, but um, how important is it that I know how to answer that? And, wh and what do you... Well, what, what... <clears throat> I'll answer it for you. You're writing literary fiction, which means, um, and you're telling short stories. So you are writing for a group of people who love short stories, who love sagas, folk tales, um, and what, and that's, that's really where I started. And for me, it was just, sitting around a table of, you know, 20 people at Uncle Mendoza Couture's on a Sunday afternoon, listening to, you know, people speaking half in French and half in English, telling stories. And those stories just sank into me. And you clearly have, you know, had some of that experience as well. Um, so that's the community you're writing for. And if you're lucky and you do a really good job, it'll go way beyond that. I mean, I've been very lucky with the Lamoille stories. Um, they sell not a lot, but they sell in England, they sell in Australia, um, and they're not limited to Lamoille County, Vermont. Right. So a great story, no matter where it originates, is going to have interest around the world. So I, I can't be any more specific than that. And don't, don't get overly hung up on that, who you're writing for. You're writing for people who love story. So get the story right. Okay. Okay. Like, and, and, yep. And, and don't, I don't need to worry about, uh, about being a regional writer. No. In fact, it was interesting. Um, <clears throat> Howard Frank Mosier was really helpful in my writing career. And when he read, um, I think it was Lala and Theron, he read, he was a, a, a beta reader for, maybe four or five of my books. And he said something really interesting. He said, Bill, you write in the French Canadian dialect. Your, your, um, your, your dialogue is in French Canadian dialect. And he said, I know enough to know that you got it really right. He said, but you're gonna be screwed if you develop an audience in Australia or Texas. And he said, I'm not telling you to take the, dial the dialect away, but he said, tone it down. Because he said, somebody in Quebec can read that and they can hear it as music and they'll get it. But you've got to leave enough of the conventional standard dialect in there so that someone in Texas will. And I never forgot that. And he was absolutely right. It's very, very useful. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I have to say you all have been wonderful. And one of the reasons I so much enjoy doing this is because I, I end up learning from you all. And um, I wish you the very, very best in your career. Um, my email address is very simple. It's just bill at shubart.com. And um, if you ever have any simple questions, um, that I can be helpful with, feel free to drop me a line. Um, I care a lot about writing and uh, not just my own. So on that note, I'm going to thank you all. And thank you, Bob, for orchestrating this so beautifully. And um, I will say goodnight to you all. Bill, thanks so much for your knowledge and generosity. It was really enjoyable. And thanks to all of you for coming. Yes. Okay. Stay well, everybody.
Okay. Good night. Good night.